So, uh, so Katie, hi, Katie. Hi. Thanks uh, for having so, me. My <laughs> pleasure. Sorry, we're running a bit late. Um, uh, Katie, well, her contribution to uh, to Black Four was the uh, fantastic find a hat that fits illustration uh, that accompanied Alex Perry's uh, Business of Signs article. And uh, I, I put the, I, I've sort of been nudging Katie a little bit <laughs> to, to, to do some more stuff with her, um, with her uh, illustration and um, an artwork. And, uh, and she's, I don't know whether it's due to me or other people saying the same, but uh, she sees this the, uh, <laughs> she sees the initiative and, um, and today is going to share a bit of her process, uh, some of the tools and materials that she uses and where she finds inspiration from. And uh, I'm really excited. Uh, we'll get to watch uh, some of her in action, I think. So um, so uh, I'm going to hand over to you, Katie, and um, people can, can ask some questions that I can hold back towards the end. Sounds good. You ready to rock? Yeah. Okay, well, we're, watch here. Oh, don't worry, don't worry too much. We'll uh, we'll, okay. we'll we'll make it up. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if I can squeeze it into eight minutes, but I can I can probably talk pretty fast and get through it, but in less than thirty. Right. But don't, don't 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 rush it. Uh, get get everything done that you want to do. Okay, All so right. uh, over All to right. you. Okay. Well, first of all, yeah, thank you so much for having me and for giving me the push that you were talking about. Um, it's I think having encouragement, um, you know, from all sorts of sources is great, but uh, especially somebody like you, Sam, that really takes all of this very seriously. Um, it's been definitely like, it's it's buoyed me a bit and having just the deadline of this um, webinar being participating in this uh, has definitely given me kind of like a, a personal deadline to, um, to get serious about selling my prints and I'll, show some of all of that as part of this conversation because I would guess that most of your audience probably has not seen my work. Um, I'm not a traditional sign painter. I'm a graphic designer and a, a branding designer. I have my own little kind of one and a half person uh, firm. My partner helps me out occasionally, but mostly I just do branding and graphic design for, for small businesses, uh, for you know food and coffee, beverage places, stuff like that. But uh, I've been doing that about 12 years. And before that, I was, uh, I got my BFA in scenic design for the theater. Um, and so I kind of always have had this appreciation and interest in what's going on in the background, you know, what's framing people's activities. And I think signage um, kind of is a part of that. And uh, right after I got out of school, I spent a little bit of time as a sign writer at Trader Joe's, which is a grocery store here in the US where um, they encourage um each store to to kind of create these um, unique hand painted signs for all their products, and so I got a little taste of the of the experience of being a sign writer at that point. And um, as much as I wanted to pursue it further, I, I really didn't on a professional capacity. But I've sort of always been interested and just kind of a fangirl, you know, about the whole idea of handmade signage of neon signs. Um, you know, I think that they're this kind of cross section of beauty and information, their cross section of form and function. Um, you know, they're living, breathing things. No two hand painted or or handmade neon signs are exactly alike. And I I really love and appreciate that. And I appreciate kind of the implied kind of higher value of human centered skills and crafts that comes along with uh, with sign painting. And so I've always kind of wanted to be adjacently involved, I guess, in, in um, something that I value and appreciate so much. And so probably about 11 years ago now, uh, my partner and I, we were living in North Carolina and uh, I was working full time and she was working full time. So on the weekends, we would go driving out to these day trips. And uh, during those day trips, we'd take photographs of ghost signs and we'd go to vintage stores and, you know, antique stores and try and find kind of mid-century packaging examples and take pictures of those. And we ended up putting together um, a kind of art show, which you can kind of see behind me, one of the examples of that. And this is uh, based on photographs that we took. And it's it's one shot on some reclaimed um, glass that's from, a, from a kind of a home salvage store. So we did a bunch of those and we put together this book, which there are two whole copies in the world, 
Um, and it's, Sam, you'd probably appreciate this. It's just a bunch of like kind of um, packaging and signs. First half is packaging, second half is signs. And these are all from North Carolina. So that was about 11 years ago. And if I can just do a little screen share here, I can show you where that went. Okay. So we made this little Facebook page and um, just to kind of support, you know, our ongoing um, work. And can you see that, Sam? That's showing that's showing your your website there. Okay, yeah. So this is like this is um really not even an active page anymore, but it's more of an archive. Um and within this we just kind of had all of our photographs uh of you know, like I said, this kind of small town, North Carolina decay and lots of really wonderful examples of hand painted signage. And um as I said, that manifested in this in this show that we put together with these pieces that were just straight out of the can, one shot colors, um, really kind of graphic, painted on glass, just to kind of be evocative um, of what, of the things that we were finding and, and loving. Um, and I still have most of those around the house. Uh, and there's there's my mom enjoying the show. Um, <laughs> So that was about 11 years ago and I got busy doing branding and graphic design and kind of put it away. And um, Dee Dee and I moved all around, you know, to different places around the country and uh, took pictures here and there, but sort of had, had put this in the back seat in terms of, of a hobby and a practice. Um, and then the pandemic hit and it was 2020 and we were here in Illinois. <clears throat> I'm from Urbana, Illinois, or currently living here. And, uh, kind of got a feeling of wanderlust and also feeling like I had cabin fever and I couldn't get out and I couldn't, you know, go and take the day trips and explore and um, see the world. <clears throat> so I ended up kind of going back and mining through these old photographs that we had taken uh, years ago and um, decided I was going to draw some, just use them as, you know, something, something to do, something to kind of kill some of this time, just kind of being sequestered at home. And uh, the first piece that I did where I was using inks, which is what I'm going to demo today, was this piece here. And this was from uh, a location sort of outside of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, now defunct. You know, they aren't, aren't selling their ice cream anymore. But um, this was the first piece that I did. And that was, that was a, I think that was in 2020. It may have been early 2021, but it was definitely like deep pandemic times. And um, I decided to just try to take three bottle colors. Um, at the time I was using red, blue, and yellow, just kind of basics and layer them up to see what I could do with color. And, and then um, outlining using uh, a dip pen. And I'll show a little bit more about that also in the demo. But uh, basically that's, that's kind of where it started. And I had a few photographs that I felt like would be appropriate um, to experiment with. So this was another one. I've since moved on to pretty much only doing square work, but I really like the kind of scope and scale of this piece. Um, it was early early on in, in working in this kind of style. And occasionally I'll do a really detailed black and white pencil sketch first. Um, a lot of times I'll just do really quick outlines as a reference point, but this one I sort of like really got into the details of that. And then that ended up being uh, kind of like this, you know, um, full color, technicolor sort of style here. Uh, and eventually I sort of ran out of my own pieces. <laughs> so I asked uh, my friend, Cynthia, who is on uh, um, Instagram as The Sandwich Life, and she's a great person to follow. She takes lots of awesome pictures of old stuff. And so I asked her if I could draw a couple of her pieces. So I, I got into doing that and, and drew a few of hers. And this is, this is one of her photographs or drawn from one of her photographs. And it's one of my favorites because of the play of this mirrored surface kind of reflecting back the neon in these different ways. And it's a bit of an optical illusion. Um, and it was kind of a technical challenge also getting these, these glass bricks and these painted bricks um, to really make sense visually. 
uh, but it's it ended up being one of my favorites. And eventually I didn't want to only use Cynthia's work. So I started kind of road tripping on Google Maps. And I don't know if anybody else has ever done that, but um, it can kill uh, many hours <laughs> if you just kind of pick a place and start driving around on Google Maps. Um, so through that, I started finding examples of signs that now are on my bucket list to go see in person, but that I've really so far just seen from afar. I've seen them from my screen. So I found images like, you know, this one, the fish keg, which is in Chicago, Illinois, and that's what this piece is based on, which is another one of my favorites. Another example here is uh, the chicken in, and this sort of um, reference point of using these really kind of blurry, not great photographs um, has sort of affected my style um, because I've had to simplify and kind of make things a little bit more crisp and, and almost cartoony um, and infer a lot of details and kind of guess based on other examples that I've seen what, what things might look like. But even still, I think I always want to try to um, bring some truth to it. You know, I want it, I don't want it to ever feel false, even though it feels very <laughs> removed from reality. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but you know, in my head, I'm, I'm trying to kind of tell this sort of like pop impressionist truth about um, these pieces, you know, um, that you get the idea, you get the essence, you, you get that this is, this is a character in the story, you know, and um, you can sort of see this the where, you know, you can see where where it's been there for a while and it, it represents longevity and, you know, all these kind of things that I am really drawn to. Um, let's see, I've got a couple more here. This is another version of the piece that's behind me on the mantelpiece, um, you know, 10 years later. I just decided to go back to to uh, the same photo set and you know just kind of take another crack at it. Um, let's see, I've got some notes here. So yeah, um, in terms of I guess my inspiration style wise, I think that some of these pieces sort of like cross over with these kind of linen postcards from um, you know the mid century where. They're probably based on photographs, but there's a lot of retouching where they kind of end up with this idealized, you know, flattened uh, look to them, which I've just always found really appealing. I, I appreciate the the simplification of of the forms um, and the kind of vivid colors, you know. Uh, so I think those are are influential, and in, I think where my current style is is going and probably will stay for a while. Um, and then, of course, I've got some other influences like Maurice Noble, uh, who did the Looney Tunes backgrounds and is a genius, and Bill Watterson, who also is a genius, Calvin and Hobbes illustrator and uh, artist. And uh, his, his line work and his ink work, I think, are um, really phenomenal and really inspirational to me. And also the, the way that he's able to have a looseness to what he does, but also an authority to to the lines and shapes. Um, and his, his visual storytelling is just incomparable. Um, Will Eisner, who is a really pretty famous mid-century uh, comic artist, um, did incredible buildings. And again, is sort of impressionistic, but still manages to have this mastery of shape and form and shadow um, without too much detail. And then Ed Ruscha, who most people are probably familiar with some of some of his work. It's more in the fine art, pop art realm, but um, you know, just kind of finding finding art and beauty in these kind of uh, commerce, you know, situations that that are would be fairly pedestrian would be things that people might just drive by and not really notice, but just kind of shining a light on it in a different perspective. Um, I find really, really um, impressive. And Adrian Tomin, who is a, a modern illustrator, he's done um, had several pieces for The New Yorker, but he's a comic artist. And uh, one thing I really like about his work is uh, how much he can do without 
using much shadow. Uh, he does a lot with color and he does a lot with line. And he creates these, you know, these moods and atmospheres and spaces with, with uh, minimal fuss, you know, that just feel really effortless and evocative. And so big fan of, of him as well. And then uh, chromolithography is the, is the name of the kind of style, the kind of technical thing that's happening here with, with these, uh, which I think is sort of similar to the way that I work. Um, and one of the reasons that I feel that way is because the way that I work is a kind of four color process where I, let me see, I can show you here an example. So this is a, a Instagram reel. Um, I, I do these for each of my pieces. And uh, the nice thing is that Instagram only gives you a minute and a half. And that's also a frustrating thing <laughs> about Instagram. So uh, basically within a minute and a half, I kind of have to squeeze in um, the entire process. Or I guess I don't have to, but I choose to try to squeeze in the entire process. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is uh, basically an example of a system that I'm pretty consistently working with at this point. I haven't strayed from it in, in probably 10 or 12 works. I've been doing it the same way. And what I do is I start with uh, straight out of the bottle, but watered down teal ink. Uh, and I layer over the entire thing with teal ink where it needs to be um, to create the basic shadows and um, forms that uh, then allow me to kind of come back over it with magenta and with yellow uh, to kind of bring it to life, you know, get the, the full spectrum of color um, there. So once all of that is done, um, that's when I go in and ink it. Um, and most of the time, almost all of the time, I do the outlines at the end. And I think part of that is just a, a, a cleaning up process for me. It's uh, with inks, they can run a little bit here and there, you know, they can bleed over and it just helps to kind of clarify shapes. Um, and always with each of these pieces, I have to sort of um, decide what's going to be outlined and what's not, you know, what, what, it, constitutes a shape and what is a color, you know, what is just a swatch of color. And in this one in particular, the Detroit's Finest Cleaners portion, I was really stuck on whether or not to add an outline to that because, you know, it's not dimensional um, necessarily, but the paint itself has this kind of like depth to it as it's kind of dried up and crusting off. And so I um, ine inevitably ended up deciding to try to give it a little bit of an outline, but uh, that's always kind of a tough, you know, um, tough call when it's just right on the borderline because otherwise I typically probably wouldn't outline something that in reality would be fairly flat. So that's an example of kind of the whole process. And I've done, oh, I don't know, maybe about 30 of these at this point. And Sam's been encouraging me to to uh, make prints and so I've, I've made prints <laughs> and I have a store coming soon, probably in about two weeks. Uh, it's gonna be opening where I'll be selling all that stuff. And if you'd like to be notified, you can go to my Instagram page and there's a link there um, for that. But one thing I wanted to show also is with each of these steps of color, uh, I'll stop before I go on to the next color and I'll take a, a high resolution 600 DPI scan of, uh, of the image. And I actually have to do it in a couple of passes because the scanner is just not big enough. So I scan each side and um, then I layer it up in Photoshop so that I have this kind of um, four color process that I can see. And then I can use that for making fun little videos like this one. Getting a little messy on my screen here, apologies. So this, I'm just layering over those four, those four layers um, that I had in Photoshop there a second ago. 
And I used a program called Adobe Rush to do the layering, but you could do it in CapCut or anywhere else. It's very, very simple, you know, basic kind of, um, not very um, involved video editing because I'm not really a video editor. I'm just sort of like I do what I need to do to tell my little stories. So that's, um, I guess that's about, yeah, that's about all of the uh, visuals that I have to show you. But now if we can, I will switch over to my other camera here and try to do a little demo. Okay, can everybody see that? I guess by your silence, if that's a yes. Yeah, all right. we've, got your, we've got the black piece showing, <laughs> which I love. Okay, great. Yeah, I hope I, I I didn't ask permission and I apologize for that, but I hope given the circumstances, it's okay that I borrowed your logo for this little little bit. Uh, okay. So let me see if I can crank this back here for a second. I keep most of my stuff in just a little rolly cart, you know, nothing, nothing too fancy here. Um, other art mediums that I've used in the past uh, have taken up a lot more space. Uh, woodworking, for example, takes up an entire shop, and I did that for a while. Um, even even tattooing, which I also did for a while, takes up a lot of space and has a certain amount of mess to it. And one thing that really drew me to working with inks is the controllability of them and uh, the fact that I can just sort of spread out on the, on the, the half of my desk that isn't being taken by my computer and work anytime I want to without, you know, a lot of muss and fuss. Um, and so let me show you here some of the stuff that I work with pretty regularly. I've been a big fan of these, let's see, here we go. Bombay um, India inks from Dr. Dr. Uh, Philip Martins. And I've been using these pretty much the whole time. I've I experimented a little bit with a couple other brands, but these are really consistent. They're inexpensive for the amount of coverage that, that you get. Um, I It takes me a few months to get through one of these because just a few drops really for each of these um, pieces is enough. Um, so, and then also you all might be familiar with these brushes. These are Flying Squirrel. They're um, the Apollo series, not this one, but the, the rest of these are the Apollo series and they're synthetic sable. And um, I came across these when I was just looking for brushes that had a nice length to them and some snap, some, some firmness so that, you know, they wouldn't just completely kind of melt into what I was doing. Um, and these just happen to be perfect. And I've been using them for a couple of years. And I love Flying Squirrel. I'm sure like a lot of you are familiar with um, Colt Bowden, who is the owner of Flying Squirrel. Um, he's also been really supportive, like like Sam, trying to kind of encourage me to keep going and you know make something of all of this. So I don't mind giving him a little shout out as well. Um, so I always use these and Typically, I only set up one color at a time um, because there's not really much reason not to. But given this scenario, I'm just going to go ahead and set up all the colors at once and try not to make too much of a mess. Um, and as you can see here, I've got this almost completely finished, uh, aside from the G. So this is issue one, issue two, issue three color palettes. And then this is going to be issue four. And what I've started with is just that first cyan layer. Uh, and now what, what I'm gonna do is add the magenta and add the yellow layers and see if we can get to this kind of color palette here. Um, and so we'll see. Just give me a second to load up colors. And I use a pipette uh, instead of the little squeezy bottle top eyedropper because half the time the eyedropper doesn't work. So I've just resorted into using a pipette. And then I squeeze a, pull a little bit of water in and just bring that over so that it's not completely un, undiluted. And I'll make kind of, usually if I'm just working with one color, I'll do a few of these like more water, less ink, equal amounts water and ink, almost all ink. 
so I have like kind of different um, different dilutions. But for this one, I'm just gonna try to keep it pretty simple. Now I normally, I guess I wouldn't necessarily assume that I'm gonna use the cyan because if I've done my job right with the first layer, I shouldn't need any more. But a lot of times I end up going back at the end and um, doing another pass of all the colors because I didn't get it quite right at first. And the thing with inks that's completely different with than like an enamel or water-based paint is that they're transparent. Um, and so what that means is that you, you know, you're always going to see uh, your mistakes, but it also means that you can layer colors um, that are basically just uh, dry, dry pigment layers over the top of each other. Okay, that should be a good start there. So looking at this cover here, what we have is this inside uh, should be kind of a deep purple. So kind of like with a inkjet printer, if an inkjet printer was gonna print this as a deep purple, it would first print this kind of saturated layer of cyan, um, and then it would paint, put a saturated layer of magenta right over the top of that. So I'm just gonna take number four feels like the right size for this. Oops. Put a little water in this guy. I wet my brush a little bit and I always have off cuts of my uh, watercolor paper. So I tape that over here because it just gives me a place to kind of test out the dilution of, of what I'm working with, you know. Okay. So I know this is gonna be a pretty, pretty dark so I can start off pretty dark and go with this more uh, saturated magenta. And as soon as I put it over that, even though I don't know if you can see very well. Over here, it's this nice hot pink color. As soon as it goes over the teal, we get we almost immediately get to that blue. I mean, that um, that kind of purple, that royal purple color. And I'm actually gonna use a bigger brush, which my scene painting teacher in my BFA, Howard Jones, that was his favorite thing to say is, Use a bigger brush, that was like his biggest tip, and it's a good one, whenever you can use a bigger brush. Um, but I think another thing that's, that is actually kind of different from traditional scene painting to what I do is that with traditional painting, you wanna, you wanna get it done in one shot. You know, that's, that's the whole point is you wanna, you wanna kind of have an economy of movement and be done and moving on like that. That's how you, you know, keep your business going. Um, you can't spend all day on one little letter. And with, with inks, the whole deal really is just these fine layers that you have to kind of stop and wait for them to dry. I mean, they dry pretty fast, but you've got you've to gotta wait and see and add another layer and wait and see and add another layer. And that's what to me makes it, has made it just kind of a fun hobby more than something that I'm trying to kind of like find the economic purpose behind um, is because it's not the most efficient way to do things, but you know, as a graphic designer, I spend so much time in the digital world uh, where it's really quick to just undo what you've just done, you know, to, to make changes. Um, and this is a nice kind of escape from that for me. And so I kind of, I, I end up sort of getting lost in, in this part. Um, for hours and hours, which I obviously don't have time to do today. So I've layered a bit of that on. And as you can see, we're getting close. It still definitely is more blue than red and this has more red in it. So while I'm waiting for that to dry a little bit, go down here, I'll get in here. And once I have all the magenta and the last thing I'll, I'll last layer I'll put in is the, the yellow. And that'll take it from this kind of cool pink that we've got right now um, in this, this kind of pink area to a warmer red, which is closer to, to this sort of vermilion-y uh, red that, that 
is on the cover of issue four. But yeah, it's um it's a relatively slow and, and easy process. Um, I think one of the things that differentiates ink from like a watercolor is it's very waterproof. As soon as it's dry, it's not going anywhere. And when you're putting it on just a raw paper like this, which this paper is Arches um, cold press, 140 pounds. It really locks the color in right away. Like there's really almost no time to, to fuss around and, uh, you know, blend colors on the paper when you're working with inks. You can definitely do that with watercolor because you can kind of pick watercolor back up uh, once it's dry. But but with inks, you sort of have, you have to sort of commit for better or for worse to whatever you end up putting down. And so we're starting to get closer um, to what we need here. It's not perfect yet. And sometimes it's hard to visualize how the yellow is gonna change, um, you know, what, what we have here but we are getting closer. So let's go back and do another layer here. Try and really get in there. Shift this from, from a denim blue to more of a true purple. And normally I would probably give this a little bit more time to dry, but time is of the essence today, so. And uh, one thing to, to say too, is that on my Instagram page, um, I have videos of this process basically for, for pretty much all of my, my drawings slash paintings, whatever you wanna call them. So if you're interested in seeing more of this or seeing you know, the whole process from start to finish of the painting, I actually have a couple of videos of working on this one. Um, with this one, I also did, uh, I used the dip pen and a little well of ink, which is my little Lego ink well. Uh, I used these to, to do the outlining first, which is another nice thing about ink being waterproof is you can decide if you want to do the outlining beginning or if you want to do it at the end. In this case, I wanted to make sort of a coloring book that I could just fill in for this demo, um, as opposed to cleaning it up with an outline like I do most of the time. So another thing we want to notice here is that the border is not just white, it's almost like a peach color. So we got to get there by layering up just the lightest, most diluted magenta. And then we'll go over that with yellow and it'll take it kind of to that peach place. And I see there that I missed a spot. Okay, so we'll do another layer here. And Sam, if at any point I just need to stop because of time, you can just give me a shout or if there are any questions, I haven't actually looked at my screen. Been no, you're not allowed there. to stop. <laughs> I can always finish it up and just like mail it to you later. And a lot of times I'll just come in with my finger and like push away a little mistake where I can. But, you know, that's that's part of, I think, what I love about this medium is that like you just you, you can't make it perfect or I guess one could make it perfect. I, I don't make it perfectly. Um, so I try to get as close as I can to, you know, technical precision. And even with that, there's this bleed and there's this kind of, you know, there's this hand done nature to it that. Um, I just really love, you know, I, I enjoy seeing what, what the process um, kind of how it manifests from, from um, piece to piece. And uh, another thing that I do on Instagram is I, because I have this nice ability to make these high resolution scans, um, at the end of the process, I post ultra close ups so you can really see all of the bleed over and um, and I think it's also kind of reminiscent of that four color process where, you know, the offset maybe is 
not quite perfectly aligned in a print and you kind of get to see that process you know you get to see a little bit more of the magenta or the yellow than technically there should be in a certain spot and it just it just adds visual interest to me so let's try a little yellow on here let's see if we can get this starting to get closer to the right color And sometimes I will mix them on my palette. Like it feels like I'm breaking the rules because I really like to do a, a only dry layers, but sometimes I get impatient. And I'm like, I know what color this needs to be if I just mix these two together. And so I'll do that on my little por porcelain palette, um, usually towards the end of the, of the drawing, like a kind of a, a final pass. Um, like in this case, I can see that I really need more kind of a red magenta here and here and here. Um, so So sometimes I'll just kind of, Get in there. Oops. Closer to the right color. And sometimes I over I overdo it with the cyan at the beginning. And luckily most of the time nobody knows what my reference is, so they can't really compare it. <laughs> but usually I try to get pretty close. And um, I spend some time in Photoshop with my references, just sort of really jacking up the colors so that I'm not really thinking that much about um what the colors should be when it comes time to actually making the work you know I'm, I'm really more replicating what I've already decided um in Photoshop and that's something that I didn't really show in this this demo but you know if I'm ever if I'm ever, ever back for another one I'll maybe go into that process of, of preparing the references um so we're getting closer Adding a little more yellow here. And there's a certain part of it too is just sort of building trust with myself about the process is, is you know, is it going to, um, is it gonna work? Is is this the right amount of this color or that color? When when it's, you know, when I layer the next color over it, will I have made the right choice? And, you know, sometimes the answer is no, and I just kind of have to accept that. And sometimes the answer is yes. And I'm like, hey, good for me, I did it. You know, so <laughs> it can be pretty fun. I don't think it's, it's something that necessarily makes uh, a lot of sense to do, you know, as, as a, um, a sign painting practice, but, just kind of like as a, as a side hobby is something to do that that's a really different kind of material material use I think um you know I would encourage anybody to pick up a set of inks and you know use the brushes you already have get some nice little watercolor paper and just have fun with it you know I mean it's a lot of it is about experimenting and learning as you go and it's it's good to have um an idea of where you want to go but not get so fussed about it if you if you can't quite get there uh, because there's always the next piece you know there's always room to to improve as you go so we're getting closer here you know I think I think you get the idea um, this of course isn't exactly what I do um, in my pieces because as I said I, I typically uh, do one color let it dry come back and do the next color, let it dry. And so I'm, I'm really asking a lot of the paper, the material right now to, to not kind of gum up because I'm just really hitting it hard and fast. Um, but we're getting pretty close. Yeah, almost there. Probably hit the uh, magenta a little bit hard there from the the outline. So if I were gonna do that again, maybe I would, maybe I would do a little bit less there. Maybe we'll just compensate with a little more yellow, just to at least get it closer to what feels like the right 
world, even if it's a little darker than the original. Let's maybe try a little bit more yellow everywhere else too. And then magenta. I don't know if I mentioned specifically, I use teal as the cyan color because uh, Dr. Martens doesn't actually have a cyan. So this is sort of the closest. I used to use red, blue, and yellow. And I kind of, I like that, but I, I feel like something about the teal and the magenta just is a little bit more true um, to the, the vibrancy that, that, you know, I'm usually interested in getting. So you can kind of see I'm getting getting pretty close there. I think, like I said, I think I used a little bit too much. I was a little too eager with my cyan, I mean, with my teal at the beginning. And so getting a, a bit of a darker, um, more sort of purplish undertone to this than what's really here, uh, but not too far off, I'd say, for doing a live demo. Um, so yeah. I think that's like probably about as good as it's gonna get. See if I can get rid of some of this bleed here before it really sets in. Not my cleanest work. And then I like to, um, I made this other little little rig here for my um, paintbrushes. I like to keep them upright and not sitting in you know, a bucket of water because it, it helps them kind of maintain their shape. Um, so that's always really helpful. And I'm not sure if I have really much else to say. Any questions about this specifically before I switch cameras? Well, thank you so much, Katie. Um fascinating to watch and uh rich has just said uh he's motivated to get out his watercolors now so, um that's great but do you want to um I've, I've put a link to your mailing list website there and do you want to show maybe some of the stuff that's coming uh to the site yeah well i can i have this the rest of it's upstairs in my little um kind of away from things studio but i think i showed you this uh, the other day when we were doing a little test so this is yeah that's this is the original and then this is the print um that of, of the original this is a, a gicle print and it's on watercolor paper it's on like the same thickness of watercolor paper with a similar texture to the original uh, and i've got 10 of five designs that i'm going to have uh, signed and numbered and available on my website and 10 of a, five of my flower designs, which I haven't, didn't really show here because they're, you know, not really about signs or about flowers. Uh, but you can see those on my Instagram as well. And like I said, I think it'll be probably um, another couple of weeks at the most before the, the site is ready to launch. Uh, and um, initially only shipping in the US, unfortunately, but I'm going to try and figure out how to expand to international shipping. If anybody's interested, uh, please let me know. And Feel free to give me a follow on Instagram. I try to continually uh, put new content there, and um, that's where most of most of the exciting stuff happens for me. So um, feel free to find me there. And thanks again, Sam, for um, including me in this. Just brilliant, and uh, for picking uh, picking the uh, the masthead for your uh, for your demo. <laughs> no problem. Gotta you know stay on brand, right? Okay.
Um, okay, well, I've put um, in the uh, in the chat, I've put links to Katie's Instagram that she's mentioned and to um, the, uh, the fledgling site, which has got a sign up form where you can pop your email in to get a uh, an alert when that goes live uh, with uh, with all the produce. So um, thanks again, Katie. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, yeah, you'll stick around. Absolutely. Thanks, Sam.